We've done lots of presentations before, but never want to release a new product. So bear with us. We think it's going to go over pretty well, and we think you're going to like the show, but you never know. Right now, we are recording the presentation. So if there are any technical glitches, or if you know someone later who uh, maybe wasn't able to make it, we should be able to post this on our YouTube channel so that you can see it. A little bit of housekeeping. If you're looking at this through the web interface, uh, at least the ones that I've seen on the PC and on the Mac, on the right-hand side of the screen, there are a number of buttons. One of them, kind of a small looking button, looks a little bit like a question mark in a, like a talk arrow from a cartoon. Click that if you want to ask a question. Although we have, well, it's almost, it's kind of incredible. We had almost a thousand people sign up for this presentation. So we have a whole lot of people right now uh, standing by to answer your questions. In all likelihood, I won't be able to answer your question um, on the air, but if you type in a question there, uh, we have a number of people who should be able to answer them for you. So what we're gonna do today is to, I wanna talk, talk to you a little bit about all of our products, kind of what we do, don't worry, keep that very short, and then spend a lot of time demonstrating for you a very exciting new product that we have, which is FlyQ Online. FlyQ Online has been in beta test for frankly, longer than I care to mention, but uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work on it in the last couple of months, and it's about right to see the light of day, and we really think you're gonna like it. So, let's take a look. So, again, what we're gonna do in the presentation here today is to talk about just briefly what we do, how we've been doing, and then, frankly, get into what's new today, which means demo, not talk. So, what do we do? If you're not familiar with us, and given the number of people on this, uh, I have a feeling that a lot of you aren't that familiar with us, we basically have two different lines of business. We make applications, apps, that work primarily on iOS, on Android, on Windows, to a certain extent on the Mac, and so on. So you probably know us for our FlyQ EFB product, which is the number three best-selling app um, on the iPad, our FlyQ Pocket app, which is available on Android and on iOS, or was on iOS, we replaced it recently with something called FlyQ Insight. FlyQ Insight, uh, which you're gonna get a little taste of during the presentation today. FlyQ Insight is an augmented reality app that actually shows you from kind of a, a built-in video, a uh, live video presentation, where the airports are. Don't worry, we'll get to that later. We make Android products like FlyQ Pocket, but mainly today we're gonna be talking about our product called FlyQ Online, which works on a Mac, works on Windows, and it's a web-based flight planner. In addition to that, we also make data. This is basically the second half of our business. A lot of you may know us from this. If you have a Bendix King, if you have an Aspen system, if you have a Dynon system, if you have a number of Android systems, we probably supply some of the data uh, to your application or device. In fact, over 20 different apps and devices use our data. Certified systems like Bendix King and Aspen uh, ex so-called experimental systems like from Dynon, from GRT, and from a AFS. You probably know that we have U.S. data, but we also have European data. We have Australian data. And just in the last 30 days, we introduced approach plates and airport diagrams for Mexico, for Central America, and a little bit far back, uh, we introduced the Bahamas. So we have North America, with the exception of Canada, pretty well covered right now. We've worked with the FAA to get what's called the DO-200A certification. What that means is that we went through quite a lot of paperwork and quite a lot of testing with the FAA to be with the likes of Jeppesen and Garmin to be the only folks who are allowed to put data into certified devices like those Aspens or those Bendix Kings. We also produce our own data, absolutely original data. You're going to see some of that today. Like the FAA produces 700 airport diagrams. We didn't think that was enough. So we produce 5,000 airport diagrams for all of the smaller airports. You'll see a little bit of that today. So how are we doing, you might ask? Well, pretty darn well. Over 100,000 pilots use at least one of our apps, FlyQ Insight, FlyQ Pocket, or FlyQ EFB. Think about that for a second. There are about 400,000 pilots in the country, only of which about 100,000, 150,000 or so are reasonably active. So just about every uh, pilot out there uses some kind of our app, typically FlyQ Pocket or FlyQ Insight. FlyQ EFB is doing great, though. In fact, as I said, there are about 20 different apps and devices use our data. So if you're 
calling or if you're on this presentation because you heard about it from Dynon or from Aspen or GRT, we supply the data to your devices as well. In the last year, we've had a lot of fun. We've added thousands of new FlyQ EFB users. Now, a lot of those people, as you can imagine, were defections as a were from ForeFlight. Now, ForeFlight's not a bad product by any means. So you wonder, well, why do people come to FlyQ EFB? Well, a lot of it has to do with the simplicity. Very often, as an application grows up a little bit, sometimes you see it getting into an area where it's used by more high-end users. You've kind of seen that with ForeFlight. They've done a deal with Jeppesen, which is great. If you fly uh, in some country where you need to have Jeppesen data, um, they've added a lot of bells and whistles, most of which most GA pilots don't need. And the cost for that almost always is additional complexity. FlyQ EFB, on the other hand, does a lot of great things, has some features that ForeFlight and Garmin and all of those don't have. But first and foremost, before we add a feature, way before we add a feature, we make sure that it's simple to use. We make it really easy, big text, large buttons, easy to hit. I'm 50 years old. I can't read something which is, has tiny text on it. I don't have little tiny skinny fingers either. So what we try to do is we try to make it usable and simple. We think if it doesn't do that, it doesn't matter how many bells and whistles it has. And that's one that's an awful lot of customers recently. Price is also really good, by the way, especially intent on Black Friday, uh, which you're going to hear more about in about two days. A lot of you probably also have our new Merlin ADS-B receiver. We've been selling boatloads of this thing. So for $249, you get an ADS-B receiver that works with FlyQ, works with ForeFlight, works with just about every app out there except for Garmin. And it's a dual channel ADSB receiver. It has a built in WASP GPS. It runs off an internal battery that comes with it. And it has an AHARS, so you can do 3D synthetic vision. Plus, it's not a kit. You don't put it together. It's not like Legos. Plus, it comes with a manual that tells you not just how to use a device, but tells you quite a lot of information about how you actually use ADSB, what all those symbols mean, what you can get from ADSB, what you can't. That comes with the device as well. This is not your run-of-the-mill ADSB receiver, and it's an astonishing $249. We also recently created the very first application uh, that has augmented reality for aviation. It's called FlyQ InSight. Get it? InSight. Can see it. The point is that when you take, well, you can download it right now on your iPhone or on your iPad. FlyQ InSight shows you where the airports are as you wave the camera built into your phone, your iPad around. It's amazing for finding your way through a place that you, aren't, that you aren't that familiar with. If you want to read more about it, take a look at the current issue of AOPA Magazine, a Dave Hirschman's piece. Take a look online um, at the piece that uh, was done recently in Plane and Pilot uh, by Robert Goyer. And it turns out that it's actually featured in the version of Plane and Pilot that comes out, I think, in about a week from uh, Plane and Pilot as well. So a lot of information that you're going to hear about augmented reality and aviation, we're leading the way. We've added, as I said, we haven't just been doing apps, we've been doing data. We've added data for six different countries or regions in the last couple of weeks, last couple of months rather. So the data side to our business has been very, very busy. Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Costa Rica, which by the way is a lovely place if you haven't been there. Nicaragua, Belize, and of course, the Bahamas. All of that data we've added recently. And we already had, by the way, Europe and Australian data as well. And yes, by the way, we've been in here, been in business for 14 years, and in case you're curious, of course, we're definitely profitable. So what are we talking about today? Mainly, I'm going to be talking about FlyQ Online today, probably talk about FlyQ EFB a little bit towards the end. Tomorrow's presentation is going to be the reverse, where I'm going to primarily talk about FlyQ EFB 3.0 and touch on FlyQ Online just a little bit. All right, so let's get to the good stuff going to minimize this presentation tool and bring up a web browser. Notice, by the way, I'm using a Mac. What I'm about to show you is FlyQ Online. FlyQ Online is a web-based product. This is the current shipping one as a work. This is the beta release. It's been available for well, almost two years now, actually. And it's a very powerful product. I'm going to show this to you very briefly. And then I'm going to show you what we changed in what's about to become the shipping release of FlyQ Online. So again, this is in the beta that you can get right now. Many of you haven't seen it already. It's designed around simplicity, so the maps are very fast, very easy. By the way, as I move things around on the screen and on the map, let me maximize this, 
you may find that your screen has trouble keeping up, trust me, the app is very fluid and very fast. But sometimes when you do a presentation like this, the system simply can't keep up with it. So uh, in the recording that will be available on YouTube tomorrow, you'll actually see this looking much smoother. You hit this button here, it looks like layers. You can switch between IFR low, section rolls, IFR high. You can use aerial photography layers, a road layer, the terrain layer, and so on. Okay. You have radar on the screen. You could have overlays that show satellite. Let me zoom the map out a little bit. Satellite, you can show METARs, TAFs. We have a lot of other layers, uh, like for example, winds and things like that. But this product wasn't done yet. So when I select, say, TFRs, it says, well, sorry, not implemented yet. Personal waypoints, sorry, not there yet. Airmet sigmets, no joy, you get the idea. So this product wasn't quite done yet, but it was very, very good at flight planning. It focused on things like, uh, this is a simplified flight plan. It would do it to and from, you can, it'll plan the flight on Victor Airways or jets or train avoidance. And unlike just about everything else I've seen, it can automatically add fuel stops. And the fuel stops are not based on proximity to your flight plan, but are based on the lowest cost to get the fuel. So if any of you are like me, cheap, and you don't like paying extra for gas, well, this flight planner is the only one that I know of that automatically plans your flight based on the lowest cost. Not necessarily the cheapest fuel, because it takes into consideration how long it takes to fly to that cheap fuel. So you're not gonna fly 50 miles to save 10 cents. It takes all that into account. And it will also optimize for best winds, okay? So it will show you lots of great information um, and get you there as fast as possible. This is a product that's been available for a while in its present form for about six months. Let me show you now what the new one looks like. All right, so far, doesn't look all that different, right? Okay, the main focus though on this is on weather. So let's talk about that a little bit. First, I'm just going to type in an ident. I'm gonna type in pain, my home airport. Just kind of zoom the map to that point. This shows me what I type in. I'm gonna hit the map button over here. It looks a little bit, let's see if I can uh, pull up this little highlighter thing. All right, so there's a button on the side right here that looks like a map. I'll zoom the map to that point. If I wanna know more information about this airport, I can click anywhere in here. I already see the runway, the TPA, fuel price was just updated recently, frequencies, all that's available immediately. If I click the map, the map zooms to it. If I want to know weather, I can click the weather icon. If I want to know the cheapest fuel in the area, I can click that and so on. All right, so let me go back to actually clicking it. So I'm going to click the map button to zoom the map roughly to where we are right now. I'm going to zoom out a little bit and let's take a look at some weather and things like that. I'm gonna switch my base map from a sectional to the terrain map just to get rid of a little bit of clutter on the screen. In fact, maybe let's go with the roadmap. It's even the simplest one to see. Now, notice that there are a couple of different options here that are new. In addition to all these base maps, I can also add in now, well, you can see TFRs are already on the screen. So let's take a look at that. TFRs, just like in FlyQ EFB are color coded. Yellow means upcoming, like this one, and a red one means active. So I'm gonna click on that, let's see what it is. Ah, right, a Seahawks game tonight. Yes, of course, or a Monday night football. So since the TFRs begin before the game and go after, it's already officially active. On the other hand, this yellow one here is probably, right, ah, the Apple Cup. Washington State versus University of Washington. If you live in this area, this is really, really a big deal. This is the kind of thing where families get together uh, and fight over uh, this during Thanksgiving, okay? so. Color code the TFRs, that's new in this version of the product. Anyone fly a helicopter? I'm gonna do the helicopter one next. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna jump my map to say LAX. So in the corner, I'm typing LAX, hitting my enter key, going to hit this map, small map button again, and zoom to it, I'll zoom out. So what we're doing now for the helicopter pilots is we now have overlay maps, which are the helicopter charts right here. So as you can see, they overlay the base map, whether it's a road in this case, or say a sectional, maybe, like this. Doesn't really matter, okay? 
So very powerful stuff. Turn off that. You can also look at radar. We now have animated radar on here as well as static radar. But what I'd like to do is to show you some more of the weather features. So let's go back to my, oh, well, I know, why not? Let's stay over here. So I'm going to turn on the ceiling layer. The ceiling layer is color coded. So it tells me that it's clear. Uh, looks like LA is kind of a boring place to be. Maybe let's go someplace with more interesting weather. I used to live in Kansas City, so I type in MCI. And let's see what's happening over there. All right, let's turn on the visibility layer. Looks like not a lot happening on the ceilings. So here we can see that the, that the visibility is 10 plus miles. I can turn on precip. I can turn on things like sky conditions. Lots of different things to turn on. Okay, I'm going to turn some of those off. Because the really fun part about weather usually is what happens about different altitudes, different times, weather changes. So the difference between this product and every other flight planner I've ever seen, I haven't shown you yet. What I'm going to show you is the way that it treats weather. Weather isn't two-dimensional. It's not even really three-dimensional. Weather is four-dimensional, meaning it changes based on altitude, on lateral location, and on time. And that's what this product really focuses on. So let's talk about that. I'm going to turn, I'm going to zoom the map out. Let's turn off the TFRs. We don't really need them right now. Zoom the map out a little bit. Takes a map a second to refresh. I'm going to switch this to the road layer, though. It makes it a little bit easier to see things like political boundaries and things like that. All right. So now we're looking at the entire country. Hopefully your screen has caught up with this. I'm going to turn, off, turn on the winds aloft layer. And let's take a look at this. Now, you see arrows. We're zoomed far out. So we can't really tell you um, from this distance. We can't put little numbers on the screen telling you how strong the wind is. We do not use wind barbs because it's just too confusing. So instead, we use colors. A red is something over 40 knots, the green is 20 knots or below, and the orange are in the middle. But of course, the winds change depending on your altitude. So you notice, let me point this out to you here, that there is this thing called, hopefully this shows on the screen, uh, go with the highlighter. Now, sometimes on the presentation tool here, this doesn't work so well, but there's an altitude slider next to the layers box. Right now it's at 6,000, telling you that the winds you're looking at are at 6,000 feet. I'm going to set it to 12,000. Oh, um, here, set it to 12,000. Notice that the winds change, maybe at 18, at 30,000. It's pretty strong winds today. Down to 9,000 feet, back down to 6,000. So here, that's how you can set how you want to look at the winds at different altitudes. I'm going to zoom in just to show you what you get when you zoom in enough. As you zoom in a little more, now instead of just seeing the arrow, you know that the winds are 28 knots heading to the southeast. That level of detail doesn't work unless you're zoomed in pretty tightly like this. So I'm going to zoom back out again and you'll see that that disappears. And you just get the colors. Other things, though, I'm going to take the winds aloft off. And one of the other features that was missing from FlyQ online in the beta, by the way, you can resize these windows. So I'm going to actually make this one a little smaller. So what you can do here is you can turn on the AirMet and SigMet layer. I'm going to turn this off now. Now, AirMets and SigMet also vary by altitude, right? So if you're flying at 30,000 feet, you get a whole different uh, issue with AirMets and SigMets than you do if you're at 6,000. So again, the altitude slider takes into this into account. So these are all of our air mets and sig mets at 6,000 or 9,000 or 12. Let's try 24,000 feet. We miss, see some of them go away at 30,000 feet. If you want to see detail about them, you just click. And there you go. Very easy to see. Convective sig met, I'll click on another one. Another convective, looks like we have a lot of convective today. Some turbulence. Okay, more convective. Okay, more turbulence. So very, very easy. Just a single click gets you that information. And it's based on that. 
You know what though? The thing about weather, like I said, is it's not just based on altitude, it's based on time. You may have noticed down the bottom of the screen that there's a timeline. I haven't used it yet. Let's take a look at that. So right now, the time, it's a little bit past four o'clock right now in Seattle. So the time marker down the bottom of the screen here, I'll see if I can highlight this. Now, it doesn't look like the highlighter is working. So down the bottom of the screen, it says it's about four o'clock right now. So this is telling me that the airmets and sigmets at about 415 at 30,000 feet look like that. Let's try changing it into the future. So move forward to maybe seven o'clock tonight, maybe 6.30. So it looks like at about 6.30, most of the air mess and sig mix have gone away. The ones that are left are things like mountain obscuration or turbulence, okay? So you can take, and that's at 30,000 feet. So maybe at 6.30 tonight, if I had a flight and I was flying at maybe 12,000 feet, ah, see, quite a bit different. So 12,000 feet at 6.30, has quite a lot more things to worry about. Looks like over the lake, uh, over Lake Michigan, you have a lot of turbulence and so on. Let's pull up winds too. Winds of course change like that too. So I'm gonna take off, you can keep these on at the same time, but I'm, for simplicity, I'm gonna turn off the airmets and sigmets and just turn on the winds. So at 6.30 p.m. on the timeline, at 12,000 feet, that's what the winds are supposed to look like. Maybe make it 18, now let's make it nine. And let's change the time. I can grab that slider and move it forward. So now this is at about 9.45, around midnight. Bring it way forward to tomorrow morning. The winds have changed considerably. The winds, it looks like in the center of the country, are heading primarily south. Well, if I move it back to the current timeline at about 6.30, the winds are a lot more hitting from the west to the east. Okay, so once again, you can use four-dimensional planning. So we're looking at nine o'clock in the morning at maybe 24,000 feet, at 34,000 feet, at 6,000, whatever it may be. You can look at the winds, you can look at the airmets and sigmets, however you like, based on the time and on the altitude. Not just those though. Let's turn on the METARs and the TAFs. So on the METAR and the TAF layer, which by the way, you can get out through a single TAF now, which is kind of handy. So in the METAR and TAF layer, those are also color coded. So the METARs and the TAFs, a green is good, red is bad. So let's go back to our current time. So right now, notice that there's a lot of dots on the screen. That's because, let me just remind you of this. This is not called the METAR layer, it's called the METAR and TAF layer. So what we do is based on the current time, or rather the time that you select on the time slider, we show you either a METAR, if it's within the next hour or so, or we show you how the weather will change based on what's expected in the TAF, okay? So right now we're looking at the time from 4.30. So there are a lot more METARs in the country than there are TAFs because METARs tend to be automated. TAFs require a human being, a meteorologist to interpret the data. So most airports don't have them as you know. If you take a look, looks like in California down the west coast, uh, there's some red dots right now. Red meaning, I can just hover over that, that it's IFR conditions. Let's move the time slider though forward. Let's see how things change in the next hour or so. So instead of four o'clock, I'll make it say 5.30. Notice that the number of dots is thinned out. Again, that's because now we're looking primarily at TAFs, not so much at METARs. We're going to keep moving the timeline forward. So maybe make it five o'clock tomorrow morning. And it changes. It looks like uh, California has particularly bad weather, it looks like. If we move that to eight o'clock in the morning, colors change and so on. Okay. Looks like, oh, so it looks like at about noon tomorrow, we have some bad weather up here in Seattle. So I'm looking here at the uh, northwest of the country and there's a lot of red dots around I-5, uh, the freeway that runs from uh, Canada down to Mexico, okay? So by being able to vary the timeline and in some cases the altitude slider, we can see what the weather really looks like. Now that by itself is pretty darn cool. And there's no other flight planner that I can think of that can do that, but we're not done yet. So let's take a look at some of our flight plans. So I'm going to load in the flight plan 
since it looks like the weather is going to change quite a lot on the West Coast, I'm going to take a flight plan from my home airport, which is called Payne Field um, in the Seattle area, down to San Francisco. I'm going to tap on that to select it. All right, so now you see the flight plan line is on the screen and so on. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The interesting thing, though, is, well, I can, again, I can move my timeline for weather, but let me show you one other cool feature. I'm going to hit layers, and I'm turning on the profile view. Check this out. Okay. There has been no flight planner that I can think of that's had a timeline and had a view like this, a view that shows you a view over the terrain, except for what we used to call Voyager, which is our window, well, not used to still do. Our Windows-based product is something that we introduced almost 14 years ago. It's called Voyager. It introduced the concept of a time slider and a profile view. But let me show you how that really helps you during flight. I'm going to turn on the wind layer also. So let's turn on the winds aloft. All right, and let's say I'm going to be mainly flying at 12,000 feet. So I'll set it to say 12,000 feet. All right, get rid of this, get rid of that. Let's keep the screen a little cleaner. All right, if you take a look at the timeline down here, if you look closely, and I hope you can see this on your screen, the first part of the timeline is now green. The second part is white. Well, what's that all about? The green part represents when we have a flight plan loaded, when our flight actually is. This flight actually began, theoretically, at 3.15 today, and it's about 4.15 or about 4.30 right now. So this flight actually began in the past. So the timeline begins at the very beginning in green, telling us that there's a flight. And then it looks like we get done with the flight at about 1 in the morning. So let's move my timeline back. Check this out. Do you see what's on the screen right now? I just moved that to about 7.30 today. Notice what it did. It did something I've never seen any other online flight planner ever do. It's showing you where the aircraft is going to be based on your current flight and based on expected winds, by the way, during that time. So it looks like we'll be around Medford, Oregon, roughly halfway or so to San Francisco. And you can see that graphically on the 2D map up above. And if you look down the bottom of the screen at what we call the profile view, you see it down the bottom at the profile view. Okay. And you can slide this little timeline any way you like, like this. You can actually see where you change altitude, where you begin to descend. See, now as we're coming into San Francisco, if you look at the lower right corner of the screen, you can see that the aircraft icon on the profile view is getting very low. Okay. The cool part about that is that, let's turn on, okay, right, we have the wings aloft on, and we have the mutar layer on. So remember that at the start of the flight, let's say that we're at about four o'clock right now, it looks like the weather is pretty good, actually. A lot of greens in Oregon, not too awful. It looks like when we get near Medford, Oregon, though, and Shasta, and maybe start to get towards San Francisco, we're seeing red dots, which means IFR conditions. Still, we're not there yet. We're only at the beginning of the flight. So the way that the weather is right now doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with the way it's going to be towards the end of the flight. So let's move timeline forward. All right. Going to move it a little bit more. It looks like to me that I'm seeing a lot more green dots in, the, in uh, Northern California around Sacramento, around Fresno, and so on. Let's take a look at one of these. What's this one say? So it looks like the TAF over here at MRY uh, is at Monterey. I'm not sure where that is. It's getting a lot better. So by having a timeline and by showing you weather based on the timeline, and showing you where your aircraft is expected to be at a certain time, you can get a much better sense of, should I take this flight? Should I not take this flight? All right. So a very, very different way of looking at weather. You're looking at weather from essentially a three-dimensional perspective. The, again, the only system I've ever seen that does anything like this is our Windows-based installed app uh, called Voyager. I've never seen anything like this online. So that's a little bit about the weather that's in FlyQ Online. We're not done yet. So the thing about a flight plan, though, is it is just a plan. You have to do something with it. You can't fly with a Windows base or a Mac in your plane, at least most people can't. So what you do is you need to do something with that flight plan. So let's take a look over here. This is our nav log. If I hit my share button, I have a number of different things that I can do with this nav log. I can, for example, take my PDF. I can print out a nav log PDF 
I'll just hit download and it'll generate that. And I can take this printout and bring this into the cockpit. It shows me what my winds look like, what my expected fuel burns are like, and so on. I see my frequencies, I see my Morse code. Um, all of that is right here. Okay, so what you need to take into the cockpit is right there, conveniently ready for you to go. Switch back to FlyQ Online. That's not all though. You can use that to send it to your buddy or something like that. One of the other things is, let me point out this text at the top here. It says, how would you like to share the flight plan? Note that all emails, because you can either download or send an email to someone, all the emails include route links for FlyQ and for flight. So, Obviously, we'd prefer if you plan all your flights using this, and then you take FlyQ EFB into the cockpit with you. Obviously, that's the best way to go. But should you choose to use ForeFlight, if you send an email to yourself, you can get the nav log, and it includes um, a link uh, that if you click on it and you open it on your iPad or on your iPhone, it will automatically load that flight plan into FlyQ, or if you click the ForeFlight link, into ForeFlight. So you can use this to plan your flight no matter which app you use and then send those emails. So let's say I was to send this email, for example. Um, I'm not going to do it. But if I want to send that email, I can type in two, three, four, five emails, whatever it may be, and I can send this to all my buddies, anyone who's coming along with me in the flight. Okay, so you can very quickly distribute these. Very simple. All right. But there are more ways of doing it. So when you're actually in the cockpit, having a nav log to look at is clearly a nice thing to have. Or at least that's what, you know, the way that people learn to fly. It's the way I learned how to fly. You have a piece of paper. Nowadays, though, people often want to load them into their GPS unit. And we make that super easy to do. Anyone have a Garmin, for example? Anyone have a Dynon? If you have one of those, we're making it super easy for you. If you have a Dynon, you can just download what's called a GPX format file. It's right here. This is it. You put that onto a memory stick. You can load it into your Dynon. Super simple. If you fly with a Garmin panel, a G1000 and so on, not a handheld device, this has to be their panel systems, then you can create what's called an FPL file. Again, download it, boom, there you go. You put it onto an SD card, you stick it into your Garmin, the flight plan is good to go. It's that simple, okay? If you want to do this to a buddy, instead of downloading it, again, you use that email option and you can email those files to your friends, to your co-pilot, uh, to your spouse, whatever you want to do. Okay, one more thing to do with this. This is one of the things that I think is really cool. When, before you plan a flight, well, sorry, when, after you plan a flight, you check out the weather, you make sure it's going to be safe and so on. If you're just flying around the corner to get a hamburger, you probably don't really care. But if you're flying to a place that you've never been to before and you really want to take a look at what it's like, what the train is like, uh, what the airports look like and so on, there is simply no better way of doing that than using Google Earth. So we're gonna make that super simple. So I'm gonna pick the share option called download. Let's check this out. I'm gonna click here. I'm gonna double tap on my KML file. Loads in Google Earth, I'm gonna maximize that. Remember we're flying from the uh, pain field in Seattle down to California. Here's our flight plan. Now, this is not just a line. This isn't just a simple little two-dimensional line. So let me show you what I mean by that. I'm gonna zoom in pretty far, move the map, uh, maybe around Portland. I'm a little bit new at using this, so bear with me for a little bit, but I'm gonna tilt the map, zoom in a little more. I wanna show you that this is actually a three-dimensional line. I'm going to Zoom down, change the angle a little bit more, and then zoom. Okay. I'm not sure on the video, it depends a little on your internet connection, how much of that you guys got. Check this out. You are literally flying over the boxes. I know this part's probably a little blurry. I'm probably moving the mouse too fast. I just want to show you what it's like moving over the terrain. So here, you can see the hoops that you fly through. You see the cities that you go to, and so on, okay? So you have this great opportunity to actually visualize your flight, not just by looking at a two-dimensional map 
not just by loading into the GPS, not just by looking at the weather, but actually literally looking at the area that you're about to fly over. If you want to zoom down and you want to see what this area looks like, it's right here. By the way, you can zoom in in particular spots. Like if I want to see what Portland looks like, I can double tap here. And Google Earth automatically brings you to Portland. So here we are. Here's a Portland airport from space. And there's our flight plan flying directly over it. Pretty cool, huh? All right, let's minimize that. So that's Google Earth. Super, super simple uh, to do. All right, so minimize that guy. All right, and let's get back to FlyQ online. So by the way, I'm using Safari. Obviously this works with whatever web browser you want to use. This can be Chrome, this can be Internet Explorer, um, or whatever the new name for Internet Explorer is. You know, all of those web browsers, uh, newer web browsers work, Firefox and so on. You don't have to, one of the nice things about a web-based system is that it doesn't matter if you're on a Mac, if you're on a PC, it doesn't matter which one you use and so on. Okay, so there's a lot here. Now you can change the takeoff time if you want to, like if you want to fly later, you can change that. If you want to change, if you have multiple planes, you can change your plane. If you want to go IFR versus VFR, all of these things can be changed easily. You can reverse your flight plan and so on. Easy to do. If you want to know more information about this, like let's say that I've never been to PDX before, which is a Portland in Oregon. I can click here and I can immediately move the map to that point. That part's probably not all that surprising. If I click here and if I say info, this shows me all the information about this airport, which is quite a lot. So I know my comm frequencies, I know my runways. I can click here, and I can see my weather. Weather was updated, it looks like about 10 minutes ago. I see my METARs, I see my TAFs. The METARs and the TAFs are both raw and translated at the same time, which is great for reading them. My winds aloft right there. Heck, if I were actually staying there for a few days, I can look at a seven day forecast. And the seven day forecast is human readable. This isn't something like, you don't have to read a TAF basically. This is made for a non-pilot to read. If I want to fly an approach procedure there, I just click on this nice procedures tab, click on the procedure, and there it is. AFD is there, NOTAMs are there, and so on. You can pick different airports like uh, if I go back to my, if I want to go back to my flight plan, it's very similar to fly QEFB. I hit the plans tab and I'm back. So if I want to look maybe now at San Francisco, I'll click here and say, show me info on San Francisco. And you can see that all very simple, very easy to do. Okay. You see the FAA flight plan. You generally see the Seattle avionics uh, diagram and so on. So a lot of great stuff there. So what else? If you're interested in, if again, if you don't like to pay a lot of money for fuel, but let's say that you were going into this area. So I'll hit the button here to move to the San Francisco area. So let's say we don't want to look at weather right now, but I want to worry about cost. I want to look at fuel. So I'm going to turn on my fuel price layer. So on the fuel price layer, again, these are color coded. The darker the color, the worst. So San Francisco itself, it looks like it's $7.85. Well, that's absurd. Okay, especially given that you can get 476, 475, and so on near it. Let's see if there's any place, oh, look at this. See, so my eye went immediately to the green one. So green, 405, way better price. Okay, so everything is color-coded and so on on the fuel prices as well, which makes it great to get to. If you want to really see more about fuel, we even have a full fuel tab right at the top of the screen here. I switch from uh, the airport view to fuel, and it automatically shows me the closest ones to this airport in California, to San Francisco. It's sorted by lowest price of fuel. If instead of flying with a plane that takes 100 low lead, I can pick Jet A, and it'll sort by the lowest uh, Jet A price. Or you can sort by distance. So find the ones that are closest to wherever you are, and so on. Lots of different ways to look at the fuel. Very easy to do documents. So let's talk about that just a little bit. So one of the terrific things uh, about FlyQ, 
both FlyQ Online and FlyQ EFB, is that you can take a look at documents which have been published by the FAA or they've been published by Seattle Avionics or ones that you've added. For example, I'm going to open up my margin notes folder and if I were flying, oh this would be very, very nice, to the Hawaiian Islands, these are the sectional notes to the Hawaiian Islands or to Klamath Falls, something like that, okay? Because we actually are flying in the Klamath Falls area. So on one piece of paper, you see what the, what the uh, frequencies are in the area, what the special use, restricted, MOAs, and so on, what they are all on one piece of paper. Very easy, tells you about the VFR waypoints. So this is what we call a margin note, and we publish those for all the sectionals in the country, and so on. If you want to add more documents, you can hit plus documents, and it actually shows you a list of all the available documents. So these are all FAA publications, or FAA charts. So if I want to look at, say, the Atlanta TAC, I can look at that, and I can click add. You can do the same thing in FlyQ EFB, by the way. So here's the Atlanta TAC, and I should be able to load that. There it is. Oop. For some reason, I got a little bit messed up on the display here, but, you know, that's life. One of the things, though, that's really terrific in doing uh, this is that, oh, by the way, you can also store your airport diagrams. If you create weather briefs, you can take a look at the weather briefs. So after you've created a flight, you can save it to your documents so that in case you ever get quizzed, as it were, by the FAA, you can prove that you got a weather briefing for it that's saved in the cloud and on your iPad or on your iPhone. So if I wanted to, if, let's say that I'm a member of a flying club or I had a flight department for a company or a government organization, or I just had a couple of buddies who fly with me a lot, something like that, or whatever it may be. If I had a group of people that I fly with and there are documents that are specific to my plane, to my organization, or maybe to the kind of mission I fly, like I say I'm a civil air patrol member and we have certain documents that we always use in our particular group, all of those things can be handled privately through what we call a group. At the top of the app, again, I'm going to try using this highlighter feature, which doesn't seem to be working very well. No. But there's a button towards the top of documents on the left side called groups. If I click on this group button, the system shows me groups that I've created. These are uh, groups that aren't applicable to anyone else. No one else can see them except for the people that I want to see them. So I'm going to click on SA Corp, for example. Um, under SA Corp, we're going to have a list of people who are, not surprisingly, uh, people who work for Seattle Avionics. Let's see if that one works. Sorry, a little glitch here in the beta, so it's not showing that to me right now. You get the general idea of, oh, there it goes. Okay, so it's just a little bit sluggish. There we go. So when I take a look at the, uh, the people who work for Seattle Avionics, I can come down here and invite new people. So if we have a couple of planes, if we have particular flight documents that the insurance company wants, checklists, whatever it may be, we can add those files just for us to the group and then add members to the group. Anyone that you add can be either an owner, somebody you can add and update documents, or just a member, somebody who can look at all the documents but can't actually add new documents. Now, I should point out that the documents that you create the groups that you create are actually applicable not just to using it on FlyQ Online, but they automatically work when you log into FlyQ EFB on your iPad. Okay? Or actually, I should say on your iPad or your iPhone. I'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, so that's a little bit about the way the group feature works. It's very powerful. I'm going to go to my settings page, though, because one of the other features that's been really popular especially with people who, again, fly for Civil Air Patrol or fly corporate missions, like maybe flying along a power line or an oil pipeline, something like that. They have specific, particular waypoints that they need to travel on. FlyQ has the ability, FlyQ EFB and FlyQ Online, have the ability to have personal waypoints, uh, basically latitude and longitude points that you can name yourself and create. Here, I've created just a ridiculous amount of them for testing. What's nice, though, is that we have an import feature here. The import feature, again, let's say that you're flying a mission and you have 50 points that you need to cover. You can put those into an Excel spreadsheet 
Um, this actually tells you what the file format should look like. It's not that complicated. You create the file um, in a particular format, and then you can suck it down using flag queue online into your set of waypoints. Those waypoints then are instantly available to not just flag queue online, because that won't do you a lot of good, but to fly to EFB as well. So you can begin flying to those personal waypoints. In addition, let's say that you create all of those waypoints. Maybe you're the manager of a group or something and you need to get that to all the folks that you work with, whether they're other uh, CAP pilots or members of your company, whatever it may be, you can hit the export button and you can export those waypoints. I'll just open what it put here uh, into Microsoft Excel format. This can be opened by, well, it should be opening slowly here, Microsoft Excel. There you go. Okay, so these are all the waypoints in handy dandy Excel format and then you can email that to somebody else and they can suck it into their copy of FlyQ EFB. Okay, so again, very, very simple, very easy way to do this. There's also something that our testers wanted more than anything else, which was the ability to just clear all the waypoints, get rid of them all. Um, you may think that's kind of silly and you don't really need that, but it actually turns out to be pretty handy in real world because let's say that you have a lot of waypoints like this and many of them were just set up for one particular mission but a couple of them you use all the time. What you can do is you can export the file to Excel, delete all the waypoints, then you go into Excel and you delete all the ones that you no longer need, so you whittle a list of maybe 50 of them down to five, to the five that you really use. Then you just use the import button again to suck them all back. Pretty convenient way of dealing with a very large number of uh, points. All right, so that's a lot about FlyQ Online. FlyQ Online, again, the main thing here is just this incredible ability to look at your flight from a four-dimensional perspective. You look at it laterally. You can take a look at it uh, from where you are um, in terms of well, your flight plan, in terms of just about everything. So it's a very, very handy way of looking at things. All right. So again, when your flight plan is on the screen here, or even not, you can just move that little time slider. Let me load in flight plan. I'm going to just reload that guy. All right. So you can move the time slider however you like to along your path and see how it's going to be with all the weather, with the air mets and segments, with whatever else you want to see. So you really have, um, in my personal opinion, especially living in the Pacific Northwest where weather tends to be very uh, dry, uh, not dry, let's say. Uh, it's very important to think about icing levels, about things like that. This really gives you the ability when you're planning the flight to make sure that you're flying not just a safe route, but you're flying that route at a safe time. Now, just because we have a couple of extra minutes, like about five minutes, I'm going to give you a little tiny sneak peek of tomorrow's presentation. Tomorrow is primarily about FlyQ EFB 3.0, and we're really going to pretty much stick to that. Tomorrow's presentation will mainly be about that. but Oh, why not? Let's take a little look at it. So right now we're looking at a flight plan uh, paying to San Francisco 40. I'm going to now, this part is always a little bit dicey, so you're going to have to bear with me. Hopefully this works technically. So I'm going to get rid of Excel, and I'm going to pull up something else. So I'm going to go to QuickTime Player. There's a reason for this. I'm not watching a movie. Don't worry. Going to say, give me a new movie recording. That's me, by the way. Hello. Hi. Yes, I'm wearing reading glasses. I'm 50. Okay. We're going to go now to Steve's iPhone success. Hopefully, this will work. Always a little bit questionable whether the uh, computer will hook to another device. So give it a second. Voila. So that's my iPhone. Again, iPhone, not iPad. Anybody notice something that if you used to fly QEFB, there's a particular icon there that you've never, ever seen before on an iPhone. That is fly QEFB, the full product, not fly Q Pocket, not some weenie thing where we had to only use two features of work. Full blown fly QEFB is now available right there. Let's go to the map screen so on. So right now, this is on my iPhone, full-blown 
Fly Q EFB on the phone. Move it around. All the same map layers, including some that you haven't seen yet, that we'll talk about tomorrow. Okay, it's all there. All the weather stuff, all the ADSB support, so it can talk to your Dynon, it can talk to your Aspen unit, it can talk to your, um, what am I forgetting? You can talk to just about whatever you have. All the ADSB systems that you have, whether it's Dynon, Avidyne, whatever it may be, Clarity, they all work. The weather stuff is all there. So when you fly now, a lot of people have been telling us, uh, see Fly QFB was originally only for the iPad because we thought that's what people would fly with. And then along came the iPhone 6 Plus and the iPhone 7 Plus, now the 8 Plus. They're really big. They have screens that are almost as big as a, as an iPad mini. So what this gives us the ability to do is now you can just fly with just what you have in the palm of your hand. So let's do a search. I'm tapping into the search box at the top and I'll type in say PA. So pain field. Again, I can zoom the map to that point and we're right there. If I want to look at some of those helicopter maps that I just showed you, I could type in maybe LAX. Go to the map over here. Let's see, I turned on the helicopter layer. So the helicopter maps are now embedded in the sectionals. So if you again fly a helicopter, you can see that. Oh, I have to show you one that's kind of fun, by the way, too. So I'm going to go to JFK. We found this while testing the helicopter maps, and it's kind of cute. So let's see if I can find this. So we have proof here that the government has, in fact, been hiding space aliens. I can prove that now. Take a look at this. See what's on the helicopter map right here in plain eyesight. Teleport Earth Station right there on the helicopter map. So if you had, ever had any questions that Earth is being visited by aliens, it's right there on the New York helicopter map right there. If you want to download data, you can download data. Again, same visual data manager from FlyQ EFB. Download whatever kind of stuff you want, turn on procedures, turn it off, whatever you may want to do. And the maps have the same basic power. So if you take a look, to try to save screen real estate, especially in the iPhone, you would notice that the tab bar down the bottom is going to disappear in about two seconds. So we try to keep the screen very, very clean. When you touch the screen, things come back, you can see things on the screen, and so on. But when you stop touching it, the screen will clear up. So when you're actually flying, it's extremely handy because you have a lot more screen space available. That's really helpful on the iPad, but on the iPhone, it is super handy. And most iPhone, in fact, no other iPhone product that I can think of will do that. Again, it works with your ADS-B receivers. You can turn on night mode if you want to on the maps. Uh, Pre-flight checklist, download data, lock the screen. All the same features in FlyQ EFB are available to you here. So there's a lot of stuff here. But here's another one that you probably haven't seen before. When I tap here, as you know, in FlyQ EFB, you can go into this kind of 3D synthetic vision. If I have a flight plan loaded, this is a little more obvious. OK, so we're flying along in, three, in 3D synthetic vision by hitting that button that looks like a cube on the, right hand, on the left hand side. But now you can also, and again, this applies to FlyQ EFB on the iPad. I'll show this to you in a second. If I hit this, now you're looking at the augmented reality screen. Yes. So this is a lot more like the screen that you get from FlyQ Insight. Okay. So as you move this outside the cockpit, you can actually see it pointing at all the airports, wherever you are, and so on. And you can even, there's a button in the middle that looks like a circular camera button. Click on that, and you'll see it. Okay. All right, we have to go in just a minute, but I'm going to leave you with one other review. I'm going to disconnect from my iPhone and plug it into my iPad. Really going for broke here on whether or not all this stuff is going to work. So give me a second. All right. So I'm plugging in my iPad and going to launch that uh, video viewer one more time. And hopefully it will see the iPad this time. Takes it a second often to calibrate, and it, uh, let's see how it goes. 
All right, so we're going to launch Fly QEFB 3.0. Same kind of deal here, same maps and so on that we just saw, but now we have a split screen view uh, available. I turn on my simulator. So as we're flying along, you can see your, this is what you have in Fly QEFB today. You can do single screen or split screen, but now when I hit the button that toggles between 2D and 3D, again, you have a third choice, which is the augmented reality view. So as you're flying along, you can imagine that you're looking outside the window and you're seeing the map, you're seeing yourself moving on one side of the screen. And you, as you point the camera outside the cockpit, you can actually see which airports are nearby. And of course you can tap on those and you can see more information about the airports. So this is all baked into the app. Of course you can do this full screen as well. So now if you're in full screen view, you can just take a look at where all the airports are. If you want to see a 2D map at the same time, you hit that split button in the upper left corner of the screen, and there you go. All right, so that's a little taste of what you're going to see tomorrow. That's FlyQ EFB 3.0. That's FlyQ Online 1.0 with the unique timeline, altitude slider, and so on which nobody else has. All right, so it's about five o'clock right now. That's as long as we scheduled the presentation for. And at this point, there you go. So you've now had a good taste of what's on FlyQ Online. Again, we have another presentation that goes into more detail about FlyQ EFB. That's at tomorrow at four o'clock Pacific time. Um, it'll have a little bit about FlyQ Online as well, because we like to show them working together. Uh, but it'll be going to a little bit more depth on what things can do in FlyQ EFB on your iPhone now and on your iPad. FlyQ Online, the one that you're looking at today, will be ready in about two days, we figure. There are a couple of little bugs we want to work out. Not a lot, just a few things. So uh, right now, the FlyQ Online that you look at by going to flyq.seattleavionics.com is the one that's been in beta for some time. It doesn't have the four-dimensional weather, uh, but it does have an altitude slider. So. I guess you could say it has three-dimensional weather. But it doesn't have a timeline. It doesn't have the profile view. It doesn't have all those export features. All of those things will become available very, very soon. So you'll see that in a couple of days. And in case any of you are thinking about gifts for the holidays, I might recommend that you uh, pay attention a little bit to what we do for our Black Friday special. Historically, we've done some amazing deals on Black Friday, the kind of thing you really don't want to miss, the kind of thing that you want to tell your buddies about. And we often there are certain products which go on there. And you'll probably see most of those, but you're also going to see a product um, which I did mention briefly today in the presentation. You'll see a product uh, which we've never ever put on sale, and it's going to be on sale on Black Friday. You'll find out about that by signing up for the webinar here. You're actually going to automatically get early notification about all of our Black Friday specials. You'll see that tomorrow evening. Um, and almost all of, in fact, all of our uh, Black Friday specials are quantity limited. So uh, by getting the early notification, you have a much, much better chance of getting in on one of these deals. Again, so Black Friday begins for us tomorrow evening. And by signing up for this webinar, by watching the one tomorrow and so on, you're going to be the first kid on your block uh, to find out about them. So for Seattle Avionics, I'm Steve Podrachik. I'm the CEO, and I'd like to thank you very much. I believe, I'm uh, going to check this, but um, if there are anybody who has still any questions, looks like there's uh, about 100 questions on here. So with any kind of luck, uh, people who have had a good way of being able to answer those, I can't tell how many people have answered the questions and how many are left. So I'm going to leave the webinar running. We're going to stop recording it soon though. And the general idea will be that We'll try to answer all of your questions. We also may suggest uh, that it may not be a bad idea to, if you have additional questions, to submit them to support at seattleavionics.com. We'll try to answer those for you. So again, uh, thank you very much for coming to the presentation today. This has been mainly about FlyQ Online, finally seeing the light of day uh, in version 1.0. And I think, in my completely unbiased perspective, I think in a way that uh, really helps you take a look at the way weather affects your flying in a whole new, in a whole new way. So for everyone at Seattle Avionics, 
Thank you very much for attending, and we hope you have a great evening.